there were questions in that file cabinet that when he brought them to memory, I remember thinking them as a child. And I remember saying as a child, if I ever meet God, I'm going to ask him this, or I'm going to ask him that. And he brought all of those questions and answered each and every one of those questions. Wow. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. Have we got a show for you? My guest today, Sylvia Puentes, she was involved in the occult and she met Satan. However, there was an experience that she had that is absolutely incredible because the converse of that is that she had an experience with Jesus. She'll tell us about and she happened to be before the gates of heaven. She'll tell us about that encounter as well. So this is an incredible account. Sylvia, it's great to be with you today. Hi, Randy. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, thank you so much, Sylvia. Well, tell us how you got involved in the occult and what led up to you actually encountering Satan himself. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I was introduced to the occult, um, early on in life, even like as a child, it was, um, what I grew up around. Um, contrast to that, I had a grandmother who was a powerful woman of faith. And at the age of six spoke to me about Jesus. She taught me the Lord's prayer. And I remember it as if it were yesterday. She said to me, always seek God, always ask God to be in your life. Um, however, that's not the route I took. I remember that um, early on, as, as young as three, four years old, I have the memory of hearing this voice inside my head, which I can now tell you, I know it was the voice of the enemy telling me that I did not matter to God, that God was not good, and that he took my dad. See, when I was um, just one year old, my dad was murdered. He went to the liquor store to buy a bottle of wine on Mother's Day, and the liquor store was being robbed, and he was killed mm. um, at in that liquor store, in that robbery. So... From an early on, from an early age, that was what I would hear in my mind. And I thought it was my own thought. But, you know, I later came to realize after um, I had my encounter with Jesus that it was not my own thought, that this was a thought that Satan planted in my in my young mind. So so I went down the road of. Of. Um, tarot cards and mediumships and everything that had to do with the spiritual realm. And I thought I was just um, not a believer in God, but a spiritual person. Uh, I started seeing in the spirit as early as four years old. So I knew that there was a spirit realm. I knew that that there was a, you know, a, a spirit realm, a spirit world world. And, um, but I went towards the wrong direction. And as time passed in my life and I got older, I went more and more into the new age and, and occult practices. Wow. Sylvia, what would lead a three-year-old into having this kind of a uh, negative spiritual encounter with, uh, with the netherworld, uh, was there any entree that you could determine even at that early age that may have given that license to, uh, for those spirits to speak into your life at an early age? You know, Randy, I asked the Lord about this because um, when you start seeing in the spirit when you're four years old and by the age of 13, you can look at someone and you, you know things about them and you have no idea how you know these things about them. Um, so I asked the Lord because I've, I've heard messages for people after my encounter. And I wanted to make sure, you know, when you are delivered from new age and occult practices, 
at least I can tell you, I am very careful about the supernatural because the enemy is so slick in deceiving, right? So I asked the Lord, like, where did, is this a gift that you've given me that was corrupted or, you know, like, what is this? And Mm -hmm. what he said to me is that this was a gift that he gave me, but because of the environment that I was in, what was allowed in my environment, that is why um, I was having these experiences that were not of him, but were definitely spiritual experiences from the spirit realm. Oh, so the trauma, obviously, of losing your father in such a horrific way. But, um, you know, that's interesting to note because, uh, you know, as you're going through this journey of delving into the occult, um, my question always is, did it give you satisfaction? What was the motivation to continue deeper and deeper into that realm? Randy, that is a great question, and I think it's important to to talk about this because the truth is that Satan does grant wishes, let's say, but everything comes with a price, a very steep price and everything and every price gets steeper and steeper. So um, I saw things manifest And I saw um, people get what they want. For example, at that time I was living in New York and the woman who would call herself my spiritual godmother um, had high ranking judges and police commissioners and, you know, come to her for help getting ahead in their careers or whatever it is that they were asking for. And they would see, they would get that. However, the next thing that they would ask for came with a bigger price. And um, so everything that Satan gives comes with a price. And what I tell people is, whereas Jesus freely gave his life for us and salvation is a free gift and his grace and mercy are free gifts. And he's ne- he never comes at us in saying, well, I did this for you. What are you going to give me? You know, Mm -hmm. excellent point. You know, you're bringing something up, Sylvia, that really has been an issue or question for many of us. And that is, why is it that one can pray, for example, to the Lord Jesus, and it doesn't seem to manifest instantly, or it comes in a what different way, perhaps Mm -hmm. a better way, ultimately. But it seems that the enemies of God, the demonic influences, are more apt to respond immediately. For example, a seance, let's say. Somebody's praying, all of a sudden there may be some manifestation. Sometimes it may be fake, but maybe there's some uh, possession that occurs that causes that person to speak in a certain way. Maybe there's a reading that somebody gives a medium and perhaps it strikes a chord. Well, maybe it's happenstance, a chance, but not all of the time. There are instances where it happens, and it seems that the enemy is more apt to look for the EBGBs, you know, the um, kind of the, 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 what's the word I'm searching for? The, the things that would catch our attention, I guess. Yeah, yeah, right, because he needs to hook. He needs to create to have that hook to get the person tasting and then going for more. And in terms of how our prayers are answered, you know, and what Satan gives and what the Lord gives, I now can tell you, I'm so glad that some of the prayers that I prayed were not answered in the way that I was expecting because either I wasn't ready or down the line, I saw that that was not the best for me. And because God is our creator, right? He knows exactly what Sylvia needs. He knows exactly what Randy needs. He knows Randy's beginning from Randy's end. So, Hmm. you know, there are so many times that my children have wanted something and I, because I'm their mom and I love them and I know what's best for them, I don't give that to them or I didn't give that to them. 
And but Satan, you know, as the word in John 10, 10 says, he comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. So, you know, like a bad friend, you know, who's bad company, he's going to influence you to do the wrong thing, to go down the wrong path because he hates God. He hates God's children. And his entire purpose is to um, steal, kill, and destroy the children of God and God's plan for them. Mm -hmm. Well, in your case, Sylvia, there seemed this addictive quality of your walk with in the occult seemed to le lead you down to the road where ultimately you would meet the head honcho, so to speak, and that is Satan himself. How did that come about? So that came about, and I want to say, you know, sometimes I will tell you that myself, for example, I was practicing these practices, and no, they didn't quite feel holy, but I didn't think I was worshiping Satan. So the day that I started calling out to God, asking him to show up in my life if he was real. See, my life, Randy, came to a point where I came undone. I came to the end of myself and I did what I had never done. I challenged God to show up in my life. You know, it was like I threw my hands up and I said, and actually I put my fist up to him and I said, if you're real, now would be a good time to show up in my life because where have you been? And I said, I'm giving you one opportunity to show up. And I just said that and nothing happened, you know, like, um, hmm. but at that moment, and by the way, people have asked me, how dare you call out to God that way? And all I can say is that he's loving he, and he's merciful. And he understands that right out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and my heart was broken and my heart felt defeated. And my heart thought that God caused all of these bad things to happen. So, um, so after that, I, it, it was as if I, I really believe it was Holy spirit that was revealing this to my spirit already. I started pulling away from all of everything and everyone that had to do with the occult world. And it was like, I was saying to myself, I want to give God this opportunity. And if I'm involved in this other stuff, I'm, I'm truly not giving that opportunity was my thought process. And one night I'm in my bed, middle of the night, and I'm just crying. And all I could say is, Jesus, I need to know you. And like, just very, very emotional weeping. And all of a sudden, I was kicked between my shoulder blades and it felt like it was the bottom of a construction boot. <laughs> and uh, obviously there was no one in my room. No one kicked me, but it was my first time having the revelation that Satan was real. And if Satan was real, hell was real. And if Satan and hell are real, then God must be real. And I think I'm about to know him because Satan is trying to shut me up. So, wow. and I, and I'm telling you, I really, in my heart, I believe that the Holy Spirit gave me that revelation. And it was almost like telling me, keep going. So that's almost a kind of a double entendre, isn't it? I mean, so you, you call for God to show up and you're kicked and yeah. in response to that, you acknowledge that that came from Satan himself. And so God was seemingly doing a uh, reflective kind of measure there of yeah. showing you his presence through what, what really was, was a satanic manifestation in your life. That's, yep. that's incredible. Yep. Yeah. And then, a a f yeah, a few uh, weeks after that, again, because my pursuit became relentless. God, I need to know you. I need to know you. You need to reveal yourself to me. Again, I have seen in the spirit realm at this point, I have seen, you know, I've been in seances, I've seen big things. And I would say to him, if you're real, your power has to be greater than what I've already seen. Mm. So one night again, I'm sleeping and I suddenly feel like I can't breathe. 
And I, and when I open my eyes, it's, it's Satan is on top of me, choking me, telling me I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Mm. And as scary as that was, um, all I could think in my head was if I call on the name of Jesus, <laughs> he's going to show up. And, um, and I just kept trying to call on his name and suddenly I was able to call on his name and he disappeared. Mm. And the next morning, my son comes into the kitchen and my son says to me, mom, this craziest thing happened to me. He said, I was pulled out of my bed and Satan was spinning me around in my room. My son, not knowing what, you know, had a, what I had experienced. And again, that is because I had all of these open doors, Randy, because of everything, you know, I had no idea yet about repenting or anything like that, closing those doors. Wow. So how old was your son at the time? My son was 16 at the time. And had your son had any uh, spiritual experiences for this? My son had not had any spiritual experiences before oh, this. So it was concurrent with yours. Yes. So it seemed like yeah. Satan... You called out Jesus, he had to get off you. And so I went over to your son. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so I'll tell you um, about the encounter. And this is what I call like my love story. <laughs> um, so as I said, I called out to God and I challenged him to show up. And I suddenly had this hunger to pursue him. And... Um, all I wanted to do was watch testimonies on YouTube of people who had encounters and um, listen to worship music. And if I wasn't at work or wasn't, you know, being mom, I was in my room just calling out, talking to him. And I would say two prayers. I was constantly praying these two prayers. One was, God, if you're real, um, if you're real, I want to know you. I need to know you because I'm so broken this time. I can't put myself back together. I need you to put me back together. And the second prayer that I was praying, and it was the one that I was hoping he'd answer, please take my life. Mm -hmm. And I would say to him, I don't want to do it because I don't want my children to think that they were not enough for me to live, you know, to want to live, but, but I don't want to be here anymore. And if you do it, they can blame you just like I've always blamed you. Hmm. And so I was constantly praying those two prayers. And about six months after I initially challenged him to show up in my life, it's four o'clock in the morning and my eyes were suddenly open. My, my eyelids were peeled apart and my tongue just starts speaking in a language that I don't understand. And there's a power in my room that it feels as if the walls are going to burst. And the first thought that I had was, God has had enough of my wise mouth and he has sent Satan to kill me. Mm. And, you know, when I share my testimony, I say, how how warped did Satan have my mind that I would think that God would ask him to go kill me? Mm. I had no understanding of God's nature, Randy. So at that moment, I'm on my belly. I'm flipped over onto my back. I have no control of anything that is going on. And I'm speaking in this language. It, my, my tongue won't stop. And, um, and so I start having a thought, trying to communicate through my thoughts. Please, whoever you are, whatever you're going to do, don't make it messy because my children are going to be the ones who find me. And suddenly, Randy, this voice that I can't explain what the voice sounded like, but it's the most amazing <laughs> voice I've ever heard mm -hmm. from outside, not from within me said, 
You have nothing to fear. I am here. And the moment that he said that, it was as if all fear vanished. It went away immediately. And this peace came over me, a peace that I had never experienced in my life. Mm. And I replied, Abba, is this you? You know, in Romans, the word says that our spirit cries out, Abba, Father, because we recognize it. Our spirit recognizes. I had no idea when I said that, that Abba was the Aramaic term or is the Aramaic term for father. And he said to me then, how could you think I don't love you? And how could you think I don't see you when I know every prayer you've prayed and every tear you've cried? And right when he said that, this projection opened up in my room and it was me on the floor crying, say, praying those two prayers that I told you I was constantly praying. And it, it was, you know, just amazing. He then showed me a water hydrant that was open and the water was gushing out of the water hydrant. And he said, just as water is gushing from this water hydrant, rivers of living water is gushing from you. Mm -hmm. And I understood that I had received the Holy Spirit. And I understood that God the Father was speaking to me. And he then showed me this little file cabinet like Back in the day in the library, they had the little file cabinets with the index cards. And that little file cabinet, Randy, was filled with questions that I had, that I had for him from when I was a little girl, mm -hmm. because I never understood why a good God would leave me fatherless. Mm -hmm. And there were questions in that file cabinet that when he brought them to memory, I remember thinking them as a child. And I remember saying as a child, if I ever meet God, I'm going to ask him this, or I'm going to ask him that. And he brought all of those questions and answered each and every one of those questions. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. He, um, he then took me out of my body. But actually, before he did that, as he's answering all of those questions, he showed me all of those times that I thought he wasn't with me, that I thought I didn't matter, that I thought that whatever I had experienced did not matter to him. He showed me how he was there present in each one of those times. He then took me out of my body and took me to my children. So now I'm out of my body. And he brings my children out of their bodies too. And now I'm with Jesus. And he took, I'm sorry, he took your me children? out of my body and my children out of their bodies. And he's holding my children in the palm of his hands. Now, were they cognizant or they were aware of, of this happening? No, they were not aware of this at all. W were they sleeping or what was They were it? sleeping. They were sleeping in their uh -huh. rooms. Okay, wow. And he has my children in the palm of their hand, of his hand. And he says to me, I'm so proud of the way that you have cared for the children that I have entrusted onto you. Hmm. And the reason why that's important, Randy, is because with everything that I had gone through in life, divorce and single parenting, et cetera, I felt that I had failed my children. And I thought that I was not a good mom. So one of the very first things that he did was cast down the lie of my thinking that I was not good enough. And he replaced it with his truth. I'm so proud of you for the way that you have cared for these children that I have entrusted onto you. Mm. 
Hmm. And he told me, your children are in the palm of my hand. So he then took me before my mother. And, you know, there were some issues that I was having with my mom. And um, he said to me, you must forgive. And I said to him, that's a tall order, Lord. And I was ready to present my case, why I had the right to hold offense. And suddenly he just looked at me and he said, I'm not asking you to. I'm telling you, you must forgive. Unforgiveness will keep you in bondage, daughter. And I have so much more for you than that. And I broke down crying. And I said, I'm going to need you to help me forgive. But when he looked at me, Randy, it was as if I was drawn into his eyes. And I felt the most overwhelming love that I've ever felt. I felt this overwhelming compassion for my mom. This overwhelming sense of understanding that I needed to forgive. It was as if I suddenly felt his heart for her. And he then took me before a friend of mine, not a believer, very much into new age, had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. She was using sage and crystals <laughs> to try to heal her body. And um, he puts his right hand out. And from his right hand, this white ball comes out. And I could tell that that white ball was full of power. And he put his hand to her chest and this bright white light went through her entire body. And he said to me, tell her she is healed. Mm. Wow. And... Um, I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I said, but if you're such a good dad, though, why did you take my dad? Hmm. And he said to me, nothing bad comes from me. And he, he opened my chest, Randy, and allowed me to see my own heart. And when he showed me my heart, there was this wound in my heart that was a, like a non-healing wound, you know, like when there's pus and, and when he showed me the wound, I suddenly felt this warm, heavy liquid come from the top of my head all the way down till it reached my heart. And when it reached my heart, it melted that wound, that wound disappeared. And that was as if the the scales were suddenly removed from my eyes and my heart became one with the father's heart. And I understood that I was not fatherless, that I had a dad all the time. I had a dad mm -hmm. and he was my dad. Mm. Wow. And you were writing letters to your dad, Abba, Abba father as a child. And he yeah. answered all of those questions that you had as a child yeah, and let you know that he was your father yeah, and your mother. Um, and obviously she had died. Uh, no, uh, my, my, my father died when I was a year old. He oh, was, I'm, yeah, right. he was murdered. Yeah. So your when you saw your mother, was she, was she, she's alive. She's, she's alive. Still alive. She was, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was as if, you know, it was, he took me out in front of all of these different people, they didn't have the experience. He was showing me, you know, he was showing me the experience. Yes. Wow. So he and was healing your heart. He was healing my heart. Yeah. Spiritually and, and yeah. also your, your mind, uh, and, and assuaging you and giving you peace in place of all the fears and all the consternation. So yeah. was that, were these voices audible to you during this time or were they 
something that you read in your spirit? No. Um, in Before I saw Jesus, the voice that was speaking to me was outside of my outside of my uh, outside of my body it was as if somebody was speaking to me right into my ear mm. and then when i saw jesus his lips were never moving my lips were never moving but we were instant communication it was like this instant telepathic communication that before i could even finish a question he was already answering the question mm. <laughs> yeah that's that's a question that oftentimes people ask us who are uh, near death uh, or afterlife survivors uh, is that, and your experience fits into that category of the the near death or being transported or what have you, um, is how the Lord speaks to us. You know, is it audible? Is it uh, intuitive? That is uh, just something that we would know uh, innately uh, between our, ourselves and, and God. And it's both, isn't it? I mean, the, the way yes. that God speaks to us, and in my experience as well, was both audible and through that sense of knowing that we were speaking. And, mm -hmm. I, and I've oftentimes prayed about that. And the answer I get is that uh, goes back uh, to the Holy Spirit and Jesus being one, per, they're, they're, they're entities, persons as one, as, as the Father, but they speak to us in those ways as a single voice, but also as Jesus is the uh, is is very precious to us because I, Jesus Jesus revealed Himself to you in a way yeah. that was healing you of all of these uh, pains and losses. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, feel completely healed at that point? I did. I did. Mm -hmm. No. Um, one question that I've been asked is, well, what did he look like? Mm -hmm. And I could describe, you know, he looked like what we have seen in most paintings or, you know, most depictions of him, but it wasn't so much what he looked like. It was what it felt like to be in his presence. Um, as I said, it was the most overwhelming sense of love that I have ever experienced in my life. Um, I, I, I compare it to I'm a mom and when I see my two kids or when I think about my children, it feels like my heart is going to just come out of my chest. Well, this was infinitely more than that. And that in itself was healing Randy, because when he appeared at no point did he say, I don't like what you've thought about me or what you've said about me or the way you called out to me. I was simply received. You know, I felt like the prodigal son, right? That <laughs> the dad <laughs> ran to him and just received him. And I was yeah. just simply received. Mm. And, and your friend was healed of cancer as well. Yes. My friend was healed. It's been nine years since that encounter. She, um, cancer cells have never again been found in her body. And I am so happy to say that she too now is saved and her family is saved and she's brought others <laughs> to the kingdom. <laughs> so that's awesome. That is awesome. And I love how you described it. That, that ball of light, did you say, or that? Yeah, it was intense. a big white ball of light. It was like light and fire at the same time, if you can imagine that. And I just knew because being in his presence, it's like, you just know, it's an instant knowing of things, you know, it's an instant revelation of things. And I just knew that there was power in that ball. <laughs> there is. And, and certainly within the Bible, many references to the light of Christ, the pillar of fire, of course, before the Jewish people ex who were exiting uh, from Egypt. There's the burning bush. There's the light of Christ that many of us have experienced in being pulled by that light. There's the mm -hmm. light that uh, many testimonies emanating from, from Jesus, uh, his glory, really. And yeah. Sylvia, we were talking uh, before we started this uh, show and 
how you felt compelled to express the heart of God, that he wasn't, he had perhaps every right to be angry at you as he did with me or anyone who, who really opts to go against his will or delve into the, uh, the, the area realm that is diametrically opposed to him, but he didn't, he didn't for you, certainly didn't for me either. So tell us about that, the heart of God, when you were in the occult, and obviously you had sought from an early age answers to those questions, and you were being pulled into this abyss of feeling abandoned and, and just wanting to, wanting to die, um, to that love that perhaps you were searching for Tell somebody who might feel like they haven't experienced that love and they have no hope. Uh, what encouragement would you give to that person now? I would encourage to ask him to reveal to them how much he loves them. Because I found that he will always show up and he will answer that. And when I came out of that encounter, Randy, the circumstances that I was dealing with were all the same. However, I was different. Mm. I, you know, that one encounter, that, that time in his presence, that healing that he did to my heart completely changed me. My life was changed from that moment on. And so... I would say, call out to him and ask him to reveal how much he loves you. You know, one of the one of my favorite things and one thing that he has talked to me about is to help others understand the depth of what happened at the cross. I think that a lot of people think that the cross was... And I don't want to, uh, I hope this is understood, it was just about salvation. And while salvation is huge, it wasn't just about salvation. His great love for us propelled him to that cross because he could not stand the thought of being apart from us. And I know, Randy, because when I was in his presence and, and just living in his presence, it's as if I'm the only one there. So he would have done that if only Randy would have said yes to him, if only Sylvia would have said yes to him. And, you know, one of the things that he allowed me to have the experience of when I had this encounter with him was he allowed me to feel his heart. And so he showed me, he, he took me like, it was like a scene in New York City with people walking back and forth, you know, like the hurriness. And he said, look at this, my creation walking to and fro, to and fro, and they don't stop to look up or to call on my name. And it, I could feel his heart. And I always say, this, he only allowed me to feel a morsel of the heartbreak that he feels mm -hmm. being separate from us or when we don't believe in him or we don't know his nature. He allowed me to feel a little bit of the heartbreak because if he had allowed me to feel the fullness of it, I, I couldn't take it. My heart couldn't take it. As it was, my heart felt like it was concaving. And then he allowed me to feel his love. Every person he took me before or every, he gave me messages for my brothers and my sisters. And so, and he said, share this with them so that they would know that you were in my presence. Mm -hmm. And every time he took me before someone, he allowed me to feel his heart for that person. And that's why I say it was, I couldn't, my heart couldn't take it. It felt like my heart was going to explode. Mm. So, 
you know, when he says that I have loved you with an everlasting love, I experienced that everlasting love. And it was that everlasting love that transformed me and changed my life. So beautiful. You know, I get what you say, Sylvia, about the heart and understanding that he went to the cross because of his love for you and me. And I, and I love what you say about he would, if it was just, just you alone, and I'm, yeah. we're speaking to you who yeah. are listening to this, he would do it all over again. You know, when I was in surgery and the chest would be open and I would just look at that heart my instant impression of that was that it wasn't just a beating piece of flesh, mm -hmm. that there was something very ethereal, very, very spiritual, the aspect of the heart. The heart is the definition of life. Uh, when it beats, it uh, is the definition of death when it stops beating for a human being. And so it is the heart of who we are. I mean, in terms of our ability to live and the heart, spiritually speaking, is, is at the heart of our being able to live eternally with uh, Jesus Christ. And while, without going through too much and, uh, you know, analogies between the heart, the fact that you had experienced that heart, that physical heart kind of uh, parallels what I had experienced in the operating room. Uh, with the heart and then that you're the first person actually who is who has drawn the parallel between the uh, feeling the heart that is the very heart uh, and, f and feeling the love of God and of course the Bible speaks to that uh, that heart after God that mm -hmm. and the heart is ever present in much of what we talk about and we don't really maybe talk about why the heart is so quintessential to our discussion, but the heart is both spiritual and it's also uh, what, what keeps us alive in this world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I have to share this. So I'm, uh, I'm a nurse and um, he speaks to me in anatomical terms sometimes so that I can understand. And he showed me, the heart. This was about two years ago, um, because part of what he's asked me to do is to minister to the hearts. And so he showed me um, a heart and he showed me the arteries and the arteries were all clogged and occluded. And he said they were clogged and occluded with um, bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment. And then he showed me how his love was trying to uh, filter through all of that. And I could see how it was so difficult for the blood to pass through all of that. And he said, this is why the bitterness, the unforgiveness, you know, has to go because a heart that is full of unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment doesn't allow for my love to flow in it and then my love can't flow through it mm, that's beautiful and you yeah. as a clinician can appreciate that uh, when he did hang on the cross that yeah. the deprivation of oxygen and the uh, stress and pressure upon his body could have literally ruptured his heart and the cause yeah. of death if we were to do an autopsy today could very well have been that his heart burst uh, from his love from us, literally. Literally, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's amazing, amazing. You know, there's, a, there's an essence to uh, the conversation between guests that I have in these uh, supernatural accounts that comes across as, as, as profound, if not even more profound than the story itself and yours is one that is a complete transformation. We never knew you uh, before mm -hmm. uh, when you were involved in the occult, but you just come across with the love of Christ in you, your personhood. And um, I know that uh, God's anointing is on you uh, to pray for our mm -hmm. audience. And I just feel that there are many that are watching now that don't 
don't understand that. Well, they don't need to understand the heart of God. They need to sense the heart of God. And some of them, you know, don't uh, feel confident in their relationship with God because maybe they don't feel like they have one if they're sincerely, sincerely honest with uh, themselves. Would you uh, be kind enough to pray for our audience, Sylvia? Yes, absolutely. Thank Yes. you. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you today, Lord, just thanking you for your goodness, thanking you for your love, your faithfulness. Father, my prayer is that that you touch the hearts of those who are listening, those who are watching, Lord, and that you reveal your heart to them, that you reveal your true nature to them, that you reveal your love, Lord, that everlasting love that knows no beginning and no end, that keeps no record of wrongs, Lord. Father, I come against the lies of the enemy, of unworthiness, the lies that say that you are not good or that you are an angry God. And I just speak your truth, Lord. I, I, I pray, Lord, that spiritual blindness is broken today, Father, through this testimony. Yes. In your mighty name, Jesus, I thank you. And I ask you to continue to glorify and magnify your name yes. in our lives. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. That was wonderful. Thank you, <laughs> Sylvia. There are many... Many, I'm sure, that have been profoundly touched by what you have shared with us. And also, if uh, you are going through any uh, degree of suffering to the point where you've just kind of, you're on the verge of giving up, know that on the contact page of randyk.org, uh, there are three 800 numbers you can call. If you can't get through to one, go to the next one. We partnered with ministries so that you can just call those numbers. If you're desperate right now, you're ready to kind of give up, uh, by all means, call one of those numbers now. If you do, uh, or did, I should say, uh, acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then, uh, then you are destined for heaven, and we want to know about that. We want to celebrate with you because there's a celebration in heaven going on just for you. So uh, please let us know on the contact page as well. And uh, Sylvia, is, uh, are there any other words of wisdom uh, that you want to speak or any parting words before we close? I just, you know, I, I just want to encourage, as I said, anyone out there who's wondering or doubting or, you know, just call out to him. He's faithful and he will show up. Randy, one of the things that changed in my life when I encountered Jesus was I had hope. And, um, you know, when I was uh, involved in the occult world, the hope was fleeting. And uh, when I encountered Jesus, I had hope that no matter what, I was on the winning team and there was somebody that was battling for me. I love it. I love it. And that, and those notes that you wrote as a child that were answered by Jesus in person. Oh my, that is so profoundly touching. Sylvia, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Randy, for having me on. It was a pleasure. Likewise. And we have some great news for you, and that is, if you are in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer, because heaven is in your future. Take care, and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe, and if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.